Hi everyone, welcome to episode 21 of Big Cat Conversations. We're sitting in a farmhouse in Somerset in the Quantocks. We've been helping Matt Everett finish his documentary, Britain's Big Cat Mystery, which is coming out later in 2020. And we're taking the opportunity to interview two trackers who are from the search and rescue community, but also have a lot of experience in animal tracking. And we're going to be talking about their experience in Cornwall mainly, which is where they're based. And it's Jay and Rhoda. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Hi. Could we start straight away in Cornwall a few years back, Jay, with your encounter of a black cat in... A qu- in a quarry area in Cornwall somewhere? Yeah, so uh, within Cornwall, obviously we've got a lot of China clay industry land, uh, so from St Orsel up to basically Bodmin Moor. So it's kind of just off the patch of, of the so-called beast of Bodmin Moor. Uh, there's there's a, a number of roads, obviously, and habitations throughout that area. I was travelling down one of the roads one day um, and looking across the valley to a, a reprofile part of the hill. This is obviously China clayway, so it's bright white and it must be about a distance of about 800 meters off there was a, a big black cat unmistakably um com- kind of traversing down this slope alongside a hedge definitely a cat the posture just just down on its haunches the muscular tone i mean even from that distance and and the proportionality of the tail it was just unmistakably leopard uh, there's, there's no way it could be a labrador or a german shepherd it's just that the shape was all wrong the movement was all wrong the position the it's just cat unmistakably um, unfortunately the road was too too narrow and it was quite a busy road so I couldn't stop to get a better look uh, if I did it would have disappeared <laughs> undoubtedly what were you doing at the time? I was just driving along the road okay. driving along the road and just 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 looking across at the clay tips I say they're bright white and you, you couldn't ask for a better contrast for a view really the only, only only thing better would be if I was closer but how much of a surprise for you was that were you you were aware of big cat gossip in the area weren't you i'm, I'm aware of big cat folklore effectively yeah within obviously bobman the beast of bobman more um around the china clay tips and, and pits the, there's more of a folklore of, i think of puma so to see a leopard in an on exposed clay tip just caught by quite by surprise were you uh, skeptic before then or did you have a view on it or how much did that sort of change your perspective on the whole subject? I think it reinforced it. I've, I've heard stories, I've heard account, accounts from other people, very credible people. Um, yeah, seeing it for myself, it, it, it obviously brings it home. But look, looking at the, the terrain and the habitat you've got there, it, in my mind, it would be a question of why isn't there a cat in there? What do you think it was doing? <clears throat> It, it looked like it was stalking, looking, looking for prey, or, or at least stalking prey further down, possibly rabbits, because it was just quite a, quite a low hedge, and it was really down its haunches. It was trying to get below that, that line of the hedge as it was travelling down the valley. Okay, and you, you were telling me before we started this interview that you think that whole landscape of pits and tips and, um, and the, the re- reclaimed landscape and the scrub is ideal for big cats. Absolutely. The, the China clay industry and, and mining generally in Cornwall, it occupies a, a, a large area of land. You, you could quite easily travel 10 miles, 15 miles and barely touch tarmac. This is densely vegetated stuff, um, lots of willow, uh, gorse, very, very dense vegetation. As you get down towards St. Also, there's a lot more rhododendron and things, which again is ideal for, for cats. Um, pe- people cannot physically get access to it or that it is private land that's owned by one of the mining or quarrying companies. Um, and particularly when you look at some of the big China clay pits, they, they are huge pits in their own right, where all the, the China clay has been extracted and then the, the subsequent tips. So th- there's quite an undulating profile to the land. Uh, it, it's just ideal for navigating through and not get sighted yeah yeah and there's river corridors nearby then there's open moorland and, and some of the peninsulas and there's bodmin moor to the north and uh, east of that so all of that sort of extends the big cat sort of country in cornwall is that right absolutely it's just it's just the, the veins kind of leading out from that mass of china clay land mm. and we, we've got deer, the deer population down there we've got um, a few red that have kind of migrated down from Dartmoor and Exmoor down towards even as, as far as Land's End. And these are red deer. Uh, the row, the extent of the row deer, they're, they're <coughs> broadening the habitat quite significantly now. Mm. Um, so th- there's prey species there, let alone rabbit and the other usual prey species. Yeah. 
and people who work in the in the industry, that quarry industry, sometimes report them, don't they? There's been there's been stories of um, other workers. I think the, the again, it's one of the kind of myths and legends of the area that a lot of the people working in the China clay industry are aware of the cats, and there's, there's stories that they even feed them occasionally. Um, yeah, and there's the the odd story of uh, another driver arriving with a lorry and and spotting something, and then uh, yeah. And reporting it because he's working reporting on contract, because, yeah, not, not absolutely. the company. He, yeah. he, he's not aware of the, the little in that yeah, we don't mention those. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. Um, I've had a few reports over the years from Cornwall quarries. Um, one of the best ones was a lady who said she's walking her dog down t to one, very isolated in the bottom. It was, a, it was an old derelict one, but it had a bit of a sort of a pond lake in the, in the bottom. Yeah. And she said a black panther emerged on the scene when they were totally isolated and vulnerable down there and the dog was round the other side where the cat emerged, and the cat sat up and basically said, gave all the vibes to just go away, otherwise, you know, you're for it. And yeah. she said it was remarkable how it just tolerated them, uh, and it was basically giving them a message to leave the scene as quickly as possible. And she was very, um, I think she felt it was fairly impressive, you know, the, the, the communication of that animal. I'm the, I'm the boss here, you've invaded my territory, please leave, otherwise the dog gets it. Absolutely, I read that as intelligence of the animal, and that it, it doesn't want to make a fuss. It's, it's, it's doing its thing, and it just has had this this um, contact, and just wants to the disturbance. Yeah, yeah, yeah it just yeah, it just wants to get get on with what it knows. It knows full well if it makes a fuss, then it's going to be the absolutely. next the next thing hunted. Or yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Thanks for that, Jay. So we move from Cornwall to South Africa, and welcome, Rhoda. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And can you tell us all about the experience you had growing up in um, getting tips from people in South Africa for the great outdoors and tracking and learning about nature? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I spent my early childhood in South Africa. Um, my dad was very outdoorsy, took me out for walks a lot of the time. Uh, we've spent lots of time in the national parks as well. So I did get a really privileged kind of childhood in terms of wildlife exposure and, um, you know, just learning about the great outdoors. My dad was great for that. Um, so I guess from a really early age, I was very interested in wildlife and very interested in tracking. Um, I, ha I always tell this little story that I, um, ha I was just really fortunate to be able to play with some lion cubs as a very small child because my dad, I think he had a secretary it was, uh, who had a, a small wildlife rescue centre and obviously cubs need feeding on a very regular basis so she would bring them into work and then my dad would bring me into work and I'd get some really lovely time playing with these you know lion cubs as a very very young child and obviously that stuck with me and I've, I've always had a fascination with big cats um, I'm actually quite scared of lions now but that's another story did you ever get scratched <laughs> no no it was only you know it was only so we, would, we would play with them until they grew a little bit bit too big to be interacting with anymore and then it would you know that would finish but and I guess it kind of coincided with them not needing feeding so regularly anyway so they were just out then in the sanctuary wow. yeah just a really lucky lovely childhood actually um, lots of fond memories of being outdoors in Africa uh, and then we moved here to the UK moved to Cornwall um, still you know obviously had lots more new things to learn about then different wildlife different plants my dad took me out again with lots of walks um, and I, when I went to college eventually, to university, I studied zoological conservation management. Um, and then as part of that course, I was introduced to, formally kind of introduced to tracking as, as a subject. And it was always something that I'd done naturally anyway. Um, I just didn't know there was a, there was a it was a thing. <laughs> you know? yeah, an activity. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, I learned quite a lot. I, I taught myself a bit. I was taught by some, you know, some great teachers as well. Um, started teaching other people. So I, I tracked people and animals, um, trained a lot of people, and then eventually went full circle back to, well, well, to Namibia, so Southern Africa again, because I wanted to spend some time with the sand bushmen in Namibia, um, who are our oldest living ancestors. The Human Genome Project has sort of proved that they mm. are you know, the closest link to our hunter-gatherer uh, ancestors. And I wanted to learn their traditional skills, particularly tracking. So I spent a bit of time there with um, a really lovely group of Bushmen who taught me all sorts of skills from sort of making bows and arrows and making spears to really in-depth 
tracking and stalking. So, you know, I thought I knew tracking and I thought I was a fairly decent tracker until I went there. But then I really honed my skills out there and the Bushmen taught me. I, you know, credit them with pretty much everything I know now is, is based on what I learned from them. They take it to a different level for they, them. It's a daily need, necessity for survival yeah. and... Um, yeah, and they, they, you know, it's just that they've kept that tradition going and um, they are just the most skilled, skilled hunters, really, and the most skilled trackers that there are, I think, in the world today. You know, and as an Indigenous people, they're very welcoming and, you know, took me, took me under their wing and, and we spent a lot of time learning and it was just fantastic experience. So I try and bring that now to obviously, you know, I, I, and while I was out there, we were tracking leopard, tracking lion, you know, obviously even even in africa big cats are quite leopard particularly are quite elusive creatures and very hard to find so it was always very exciting <laughs> when we came across leopard tracks because you know it, it's the it's the one that people want to see but rarely do so that um is something that i've then tried to kind of bring back to here and apply to what i what i'm doing now yeah yeah well it's great that you're on the case and sort of part of the part of the squad of people helping <laughs> and does it bug you that you've not yet seen a big cat in britain a little bit, but I know so many people who have. So it's kind of just one of those things. And I, you know, It seems to be my luck, actually. I spent six months tracking otters for the Cornwall Wildlife Trust, and I didn't see a single otter for that time either. So I think that's just part of, you know, <laughs> I'm not lucky with sightings, but I'm just, I guess I'm fortunate that I'm able to read the sign. So I know when something's been there, even if I haven't been fortunate enough to see it myself. Sure, yeah. OK. Do you think you've seen leopard tracks? I mean, I know we have, we've, this weekend we've seen some prints which are ambiguous. They're sort of 50-50 yeah, yeah, and they're the right, yeah. in the right zone for a big cat. But do you think you've seen full-on leopard uh, prints in Britain yet? I mean, well, what we've seen, what we've seen this weekend, like, if, if I was in Africa, I would have said, oh, a leopard, you know, because you mm. haven't got lots of dogs running around of different breeds that are, mm. you know, potentially um, fooling you. Yes. Um, I have seen, I've seen a very distinctive puma track actually in Cornwall, mm. which I couldn't have attributed to anything else. And there was also kind of corroborating sign around that. So there was a hare and there was a scat and there was um, a sh two sheep that had been killed um, very nearby. So that, because I had all of the other evidence around as well to kind of corroborate my findings, I, I, I could say that was definitely, definitely a puma track. Okay, well done. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned otters. We were going to talk about beavers because you guys are linked to the beaver project in Cornwall. Could we have just two or three minutes on that and what you're learning from that? Because you're using trail cameras and engaging we with the public are. on that. Sounds wonderful. So can yes. we hear about the beavers in Cornwall? It's actually part of Jay's. Um, he's, he's at university currently doing conservation and ecology course and it's part of his work experience. So I've tagged along because I just think it's fascinating and I'm all for rewilding and, you know, reintroducing our, our kind of native species back into mm. into the UK. But I'll let Jay tell you a bit more about that because it's his, uh, his <laughs> thing that I'm just piggybacking <laughs> onto. Yeah, so we're both, both lucky enough effectively to volunteer there. Um, the, the, the beaver are interesting little characters. Um, and in oversized guinea pigs, aren't they? Oversized guinea pigs, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, they're, they're kind of, for, from, from a tracking perspective, to, to be a bit geeky, they're, they're, they're very interesting and they've got two completely different, the fore and hind footprints are completely different. Mm. Um, and they've got this lovely little thing that travels along behind them as in their tail, like a tail drag from an otter or whatever, you've got a nice stripe, but with this it very nicely kind of smooths over and plasters out the, the footprint. So they're interesting, and, and especially kind of migrating from water to land and, and back and forth. They're, they're tricky little characters, and their behaviour is interesting. So if we, we see a tree that they've started to kind of work on and we think right okay that's great we'll sort of set some cameras up on that particular tree um we we'll go back and review it after a week and yep they're still chewing away at that tree and then they just abandon it entirely so the behavior is always interesting to try to get one step ahead of them to get the cameras in the right place to try to capture capture something uh, i think we've kind of we've got it fairly well it's, sussed at the moment we've yeah. got one one area where they're, they're highly active interacting mutual grooming and, and things so we've kind of concentrated most of the cameras in that one particular area at the moment it's taken us a very long time though actually yeah. several weeks to to hone where you know to yeah, really figure out well. where that to, those to, cameras to, to need find, to be to catch the best yeah, activity to, yeah they're within a five acre site so they've got it's not not too too large a site and bearing in mind probably what about a third of that is water mm -hmm. if yeah at the worst when when the water levels are up 
So we, we've got a fairly restricted area and we've got at least four animals in there. So four animals within a fenced five acre site. <laughs> and we've only got three on camera at any one time. That's the, the most that I've seen so far. And they, they can be elusive, even within that small confined area. And this is a beaver. Obviously, they've got the, the advantage of migrating through water. And if they're threatened, that they will disappear into water and the, their lodge, etc. They can enter and exit without being noticed. But in my mind, if we've got these fairly, fairly large mammals in numbers like that in a confined area that we can't spot, then by extension, a cat who, who has the intelligence to be evasive, then I'm, I'm not surprised that we're, we're not seeing more cats. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about the beavers' behaviour and how they are the sort of architect in nature and they, they buffer water movement? Uh, because, that, I mean, there's a lot of debate and discussion and um, recommendations about beavers' role in the ecosystem now and you must be seeing that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, m m m our involvement, uh, we haven't really got into too much of the scientific details at the moment, but we've got studies going on by the University of Plymouth, University of Exeter, looking at water quality, um, upstream and downstream, uh, the inverts and things. As we're coming into spring, it's going to be interesting to see what new species of plants are, are going to be j uh, popping up into the area. Um, it was, in fact, if you, if you want to talk about the actual woodland before it yeah, became Yeah, I mean, I, I was aware of the site for m many years before the beaver were introduced there. I used to actually run tracking courses there, coincidentally, at the farm. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just, you know, it was a patch of fairly young woodland with a, a small pond in the middle um, and not at all diverse in, in plant species or, you know, there was brambles and, and just this sort of young young trees and that was it really um, and since they've put the beavers in the plant species the diversity in, in the number of plant species is just incredible so many more different species of plants are in there already which then obviously follows on that we've got different species of in invertebrates of insects coming we've you know we've spotted birds there that have never been seen there before and even small mammals you know that have never been there before which is just amazing to see they really are a keystone species and they are highly influential um you know you know our biodiversity of our, our waterways really mm. which, so, you know, yeah. it, it just it's crucial to be having, having all of that back. in just a few years yes yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah, and so they could be a big cat prey years. item yeah yeah they oh could, absolutely yeah. <laughs> absolutely yeah so the, the, the yeah aside from the, the kind of the immediate environmental impact that you can see there in terms of species and things that there's the, the obviously maintaining and monitoring or leveling rather I should say that the flow of the water in, in peak water, water times there's carbon sequestration uh, nitrogen etc so yeah there's 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 some exciting work to be done there with, with beavers um, at the moment they've all got to be enclosed by license under natural England and for a limited period of time uh, albeit there are some that are at liberty so um, but as you say yeah quite quite rightly that they are a prey species. They've evolved together with, with wolves and big cats. I mean, you must have an emotional connection to them. How would you feel if you found one uh, predated and hollowed out and eaten out, filleted out by a big cat? <laughs> <laughs> the it ecosystem was, at work, it's just yeah, nature's it was, you know, it's just nature. It's just natural. It's yeah. how it goes. And actually, it would be exciting <laughs> to be... I know that sounds harsh, but it would be exciting because then we would, you know, the, again, like I said, I'm, I'm very much into kind of things being the way that they, they should be yeah. in the environment. And we are really lacking apex predators in our environment. So if I found a, a, you know, a beaver that had been predated on, then that's exciting for me because it means that things are moving in the right direction. Absolutely. And you could bring in some more from Germany or Absolutely, wherever they're yeah. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> in yeah. quarantine yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the whole trophy ca cascade, cascade we, we are missing that good couple of top tiers of, of, of predators. And that's, I think, where it, where it all starts to, to unravel. So. Yeah. I think it's important yeah. that beavers and big cats, you know, are, we, we see them as mammals, individual mammals, but they are part of the habitat, part of yes. nature's ecosystem. Absolutely. And they do influence it in a wider way, which other species benefit from. So Absolutely. that's yeah. important. Yeah. OK, now, before we did the interview, you were telling me about this um, wonderful colour range of torch um, oh, kit yes. that you use. And you were saying that the red on that, because this is a great bit of kit that I'm now going to get because we've been using it this weekend and yep. we use it for nighttime tracking. You can tell us about that in a minute. But you were saying that for w helping people watch the beavers at night, you switch it onto red because it doesn't freak them, it doesn't disturb them at all. Can you yeah, demonstrate? Th th yeah, certainly. So we've, th this is simple. So it's an LED lenser or LED lenser, some people call them. Um, we've got a few different color variations. We'll go through the colors in a moment. But as you say, with the red, so a lot of animals have never evolved 
the, the red receptors, so they just can't perceive red light. So often with the beaver, um, I've got some, some slightly more powerful torches than this again, but kind of red spotlights that we can illuminate and we can observe the beavers at night and they're completely oblivious. So I say most animals haven't, haven't actually evolved those red receptors, so you can quite happily kind of move around or, or observe using the red light. Um, I'm not sure, sure about cats entirely. I think that some cats, but only very few, that mm. have the red receptors. Most don't perceive colour at all. Okay. So, so uh, can you tell us about the green for tracking? Because th this brings in evening and nighttime tracking ab ability, which um, you know I've not done, which I will now start to do. It's a wonderful sure. tool for that. Yeah. So, so with <coughs> with regards to any of the colour light, if you've got white light, then it obviously destroys our night vision, and that takes 30 minutes or, uh, to to come back. Whereas yeah, the red is, is, is the standard of what military tend to use. With green, we tend to use the green for, it gives it quite a good high contrast. It's easy on the eye. And again, in terms of colour receptors, we, we have evolved to have a broader perceptive, a perceptive range of, of shades of green than any other colour. So we can get a lot of detail out of that and we can control the angle of the light, the direction, the, the contrast. And it, it just pulls out that, that vertical relief within the print. Um, additionally, this one has, has a blue, which if we've got an animal that's injured at all that we're trying to locate, that will show blood. So the blood will turn almost black. Um, or it, it appears to be black and the vegetation, obviously, is still blue and, and still got a normal white light function. So it's a good multifunctional torch mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, I don't leave home without it. It, it just stays yeah. stuck on the really wall. Yeah. 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 Search and rescue sort of backgrounds taught you yes. that, but you brought yeah. it into wildlife tracking as well. It's absolutely. Splendid. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and while we're talking about kit, uh, I know we mustn't overdo sort of technology on big cat conversations, <laughs> but it is nice to talk about uh, different tools for the job. And yeah. the, the we've been using the thermal drone this weekend yeah. um, with my son Owen being the pilot. He's been an excellent great. pilot. Yeah, Thank he's you. done really well. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to be sending him on a training course uh, because we have been actually following the guidelines and protocols because we've been on land where we got permission. Yes. Uh, he and Matt have done the tests, the yes. online tests. If you wanted to do it more widely, you would have to do the um, Civil Aviation Authority training course and whatever, which we will um, do, uh, yeah. we'll get Owen to do. But can you tell us what you reckon of the thermal drone, its sort of pros and cons, because it mustn't get overtaken by, no. and too seduced by technology. But As a tracker, I'm quite, it's kind of notorious kind of joke about trackers is we're always lost anyway, because we're constantly looking at the ground, very fine detail, what's immediately in front of us. And we often miss what's going on in the surrounding, you know, surrounding area. You know, you, there could be a big cat sat in the hedge looking at me while I'm tracking, you know, tracking a deer <laughs> in the opposite direction, and I would never know about it. So I just think a drone is a lovely, lovely tool to be able to just give you an overview of the area. And with the thermal function, it's obviously going to pick up on body heat of any wildlife that's in the area as well, which is just really, really useful because then it shows up anything that's hiding in, you know, we wouldn't be able to see necessarily just just with a normal camera as long as function. it's not in thick forest yes obviously yeah. you know thick tree cover um with you know if the, if the drone's flying above above that it won't be able to penetrate through but when you've got it fairly low and you're just looking at sort of scrubby vegetation then it's an ideal tool to be able to see what's there in the area that you you know you perhaps would miss if you were yeah. just looking and we've had wind and rain over these yeah. last three days but luckily because it wouldn't really work in wind and rain you shouldn't really risk no. it so we've had to use the brakes in that, but we've still got enough use out of it. Yeah, and, definitely. Um, what do you reckon, Jay? I reckon it's a, it's a great bit of kit. I say you, you've got that, well, as, as Rose already explained, you've got that other perspective. So if 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 you get get the thing airborne and you can look across, I mean, you can see other live, other other animals there as well. So if you've got deer population that are kind of laying up just within the edge of the woodland, and it's unlikely that there's going to be a cat there, but yeah, aside from the weather limitations, it's another set of eyes and it's another set of eyes that can give you a, give you a perspective that you can't have on the ground. So brilliant bits of kit, really. It perhaps gives you a, you know, <coughs> an area to focus on as well, because if you can yes. see that there's prey species within an area that you're scouting with the drone, then it's worth going there to perhaps check out and see what else is in that area, because obviously where there's prey, there's predators. So um, it just perhaps gives you a focus and, and an idea of where to move next. Yeah. I think there's multiple different scenarios you could use it. I mean, unfortunately, one scenario that didn't come across this weekend was something moving out of cover, cover quite rapidly that we could have deployed the drone to take a look at. But it uh, certainly gets us into the right place by covering a large area very quickly yeah. that would take us 
physically on foot quite some time to mm. cover. Yeah, you could recce an area and decide whether it was worth going to, a sort of quarry Definitely. the other Absolutely. side of the, which you couldn't, you, you know, you'd have to invest half a day to suss it out, but the drone could do that in five, ten Very minutes. Absolutely, yes. particularly, particularly areas of dense vegetation to some extent, obviously with, with the, the line of sight, but if it's vegetation that we would have to fight through, if there is any, if there is any wildlife in there, we'd, we'd be setting it, sending it to the winds, wouldn't mm. we, really? Whereas the drone can come across quite subtly because it's quite that this this particular drone is very quiet it's just like a yeah. slightly loud insect really yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> looks like, looks like a large dragonfly doesn't yes, it yeah, yeah. and it, you know it did spook the deer to the, the, the deer to some extent um, but it didn't you know they, they soon settled again it was it was not such a, a noise that it was making you know animals really really frightened it was just you know something that was a slight oh what's that and then they would settle down again so i don't think it was pushing anything out of the area when we were using it I think what I would say is that it does ha help to have a sort of, you do need a little team of people because we had Owen really, he was yes. uh, designated to be the drone sort of yeah. operator, the drone yeah. pilot for the time. And that was really all he could do, it, focus on that. Yes. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. we, you can't, do, you know, you do need a squad of people really to help you do your work on with the drone yeah. being specifically it, operated. It's all, all <coughs> excuse me, it's all team effort in that, yeah, it, there's different, different roles effectively. And as we've had this discussion before um, about visual perception even, as we're going out into the field, if you're very task focused or if you're walking a dog for argument's sake, you could be looking at your dog and you could be, you're missing other stuff that's on the periphery. Mm -hmm. We are human, we are kind of forward facing predators effectively. So our, our visual and mental capacity is, is limited. So yeah, it, it does, it is, it's, it's a tool for a team. Well, I think if, you, if you're expecting to go out on your own and use it, then you'd be slightly disappointed. Mm -hmm. But if, you've, if you're using it as an asset, along with other... It needs to come with a pilot, basically. Yeah. <laughs> it needs to come with a pilot, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to give it a while, they'll become automated. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Um, search and rescue work, what mm -hmm. has that taught you for tracking wildlife? Okay, so, I mean, I've been, we both have, really, um, fighting for quite some time to get tracking recognised a bit more by um, mountain rescue in particular. I know that some of the lowland search teams do um, use <laughs> tracking and, and, and have trackers on their teams. Uh, so we've been working quite hard because we've got uh, what we've got in Cornwall is a mountain rescue team. So we've both been members of that. We've now got two teams. They've split into two separate teams. We've got East Cornwall and West Cornwall. And we've just now rejoined West Cornwall search and rescue team um, with a view to bringing tracking and, and teaching and training the team up eventually and, um, and using tracking a bit more within the team environment. So we have, although I've trained search and rescue teams previously as well, um, you know, wider a field, not just in Cornwall. I, I more brought my wildlife tracking skills to track people because tracking wildlife is much more difficult than tracking people. We, as human beings, leave a, a lot of mess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, you know, we, we leave a lot of sign behind us and it's quite obvious when the person's been walking, you know, walking in an area. Um, what it did do was made me focus on the details more because tracking for search and rescue I think you have to have a really good idea of the condition of the person that you're you're trying to find so a lot of our missing people tend to be despondent suicidal or, or elderly who are really vulnerable you know with dementia with Alzheimer's so it's quite um, the reason for bringing tracking into search and rescue is to, is to cut that time distance gap to make it we can find the people quicker so we need to be quite aware by reading the tracks of how our missing person is faring, how are they doing, you know, are they slowing down, mm -hmm. um, are they struggling, that kind of thing. And you can read that within the tracks. So I, I've, you know, I've definitely started to look much more in detail into human tracks, which has then gone back around again to looking for that detail within the tracks of wildlife. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting and it's a huge, it's a science, tracking is a science at the end of the day. And mm -hmm. there's a huge amount that you can go into it, you know, to, to a great, in great depth um, in you know some people say that they can tell if something's got a full bladder or an empty bladder just by reading the you know the impression in the foot the, the track in the footprint um, all sorts of things like that but we can definitely tell if somebody's tired if somebody's thrown something to one side if somebody's you know looked in a direction and you can tell that with an animal track as well has that animal looked in you know looked right when it heard the drone in the distance for example you know it just completes the story a little bit if you can if you can get into that detail i find all, all pieces of the jigsaw puzzle mm -hmm. so yeah if we can, if we can time scale it was that the drone was in that area at that particular time or we were active in that area at that time and then we we can see from a track line so a series of tracks as, as the animal progresses if there's a, a slight deviation 
feet turning one way, etc., then there's the potential that that could have occurred, the two could have coincided. And then we've got a, we've got we've a, got a, time, a time, time, yeah. time window then that we can work from. But um, yeah, my, my, my tracking's gone the other way. I've gone from tracking, starting off as a child, tracking animals to then tracking humans more um, professionally. And I think to become a, a, to be a good tracker of humans, you've got to have a good understanding of animal behaviour as mm -hmm. well. So again, similarly, as I, as I just explained the example with the drone, it's getting that time window. So if you know the animal behaviours and you know that you've got crepuscular animals in the area and that you're subject missing person that has, has traveled down the track and it's that's been superimposed by a badger then that will have occurred overnight and you, again you can get that time window so it's all these little pieces of the jigsaw again with all the technology with all the tracking with what, whatever ath assets that we can call together it's, it's it's the pieces is it stressful uh, search and rescue work because what I think <coughs> is nice about animal tracking largely is that there isn't a time it's limitation. It's very relaxing, you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very yeah. therapeutic. But is, I imagine yeah. search and rescue is pretty stressful. It can isn't be, it? yeah, it can be. I mean, particularly if you've got, you know, we always you, you always find that if, if there's a child, for example, um, every every team member turns out immediately. You know, it's, it's that's that kind of thing, and we do worry obviously about the people that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you can't help but put yourself in their mindset. And I think as a tracker, you do that anyway. You put yourself in the mindset of whatever you are tracking. Um, yes. And you cannot help but feel sorry for or, or worry about the people that you're looking for. And we do also have to apply a certain amount of um, psychology of missing people to, to our work. So we, we have guidelines that we follow, that we know how people who are despondent will, will likely behave. We know how people who have dementia will likely behave you know or have autism will likely behave so we're already to some extent putting ourselves in that mindset because we're trying to second guess what what they're going to do next and it, it can be quite stressful in that respect yes mm -hmm. yeah but you have got to pe keep disciplined and just do your use yes. your tracking and just and focus search yep. skills really yep. yeah keep concentrated. I, I, I kind of be honest with yourself as well because we, we tend to kind of rotate yes. so the way that we work together as a team is that one of us will be uh, we, we, we call it short eyes and long eyes. So it's effectively like if you're on short eyes, then you're kind of like that macro kind of detail looking at track to track to track. And you've got the other person is backing you up with a, with a kind of a wider angle Sweeping. kind of. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got more of a situational awareness. You're keeping an eye on the horizon. As Rhoda explained earlier, you could be looking at the footprints of the animal and mm. the animal could be right on the horizon looking back at you. So having the two, two sets, mm. that kind of... that prolongs our operational kind of period that we can run for otherwise it's we, very, we it's very visually it's very tiring yeah. otherwise you know to be to be tracking especially if you're kind of step by step and really focused it's very very tiring and you get tired very quickly and it's as a tracker you have to it's, it's one of the key kind of um things that you have to be as a tracker is honest you know i'm tired now i can't go anymore we need to switch it up or we need a break you know yeah, there's, no, there's, no, there's no 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 room for egos in it at all you've, you've got to be completely honest with yourself and with whoever you're working with yes. in that time for us to, to change over or just to rest entirely yeah but that's tell them yeah. well it's very nice that there's a link that there's, you're, you're creating a bridge between the search and rescue community and wildlife tracking and yes. big cats and yes. do you meet people in the sort of tracking community who could be interested in big cats but they sort of can't believe it or they have a sort of un they're uncomfortable with it or they're high status people so they sort of shun it is is there that kind you, of thing it goes on in other sectors it does it go on in your tracking uh, sector you know in tracking especially in wildlife tracking i think most people are fairly open to the idea and i think if people are out in you know out in the outdoors and talking to other people who are outside a lot you know even into the kind of you know bushcraft community for example yeah. we all talk to each other and and people who are outdoors a lot are more likely to see things <laughs> that other people aren't. So there's not, I, I haven't come across a huge amount of sceptics actually. Um, no, well, not I, at all. I think with trackers, you've got to be fairly receptive to whatever you are coming across. It's not like you can kind of force the tracks to be there or that you can create the world the way that you want it to. You have to be receptive to what you are seeing and be open to possibilities. Yeah. If, you, if you go in with a pre, pre kind of judged idea that this, this is... Well, they don't is, exist. You're this, then this you're, is the you're assemblage of what... There's yeah. a limit to what you could yeah. see. see yeah. Yeah. You have to be open-minded yeah. as a tracker because all sorts of things turn up and you don't know what's coming next. So, yeah. you know, if you, if you were close to the idea of there being any big cats in, in the UK, then you're just never going to see those... <laughs> you know, you're never going to see it, are you? You're just going to dismiss everything. So yeah. I think yeah. you'd be a really bad tracker Absolutely. if you were dismissive of anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Final session 
Big Cats in the UK, what do you reckon about it? No right or wrong. Jay, first. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, so bigger uh, picture, what do you think? My view is, I mean, uh, going, going back through the millennia that we've had big cats within the UK, we've had lions, we've had um, obviously lynx more recently. Um, we're both very big on rewilding. And part of my view is if there are these big cats in the UK now and they are th surviving or thriving, um, with minimal issues and conflict with humans, then this sets a good precedent now for the reintroduction of lynx and such to like, even wolves. That would be the ideal in my mind. I, I, I know that being, being the UK, that that's very unlikely to happen. But to, to re-establish um, the, the proper assemblage of species that we've got and a proper trophic cascade or trophic level so that we, we don't need to interfere as, mm. as we do at the moment at the moment it's just we eradicate everything that we can mm. effectively so so i'm all for big cats being in the uk if they're not causing a problem brilliant if they do start, do start causing problems normally these things can be mitigated with some fairly simple remedies it's, it's nowhere near as complicated or as uh, problematic as people may think mm. Yeah, and and um, having chatted with you over the weekend, I know that things like links reintroduction and and the p perspectives on wolves that you wouldn't be forcing that. You'd be saying, let's have a think about it and do it carefully with all stakeholders Absolutely. considering it. You're not one of these Absolutely, zealots yeah. who would say, you know, uh, you know, it's got to happen soon and urgently, and it's definitely going it, to. It, it's all all very crucial on public engagement. You've got to get people on the side. On side. We, we've got to get around some of the kind of mysticism that we're seeing, especially like wolves, as, as an example, the big bad wolf. There's all these stories throughout our history and throughout European culture of, of wolves being the, these big bad things. Um, however, w we've got the model in Europe itself now where wolf reintroductions have become very successful. And we've got this spread of wolves throughout, throughout Europe who are being monitored effectively by ecologists and conservationists. Um, so it's happening we can we can step back and we can we can observe what's happening in real time now and and then look at applying that longer term within the uk mm -hmm. if if the the need or the appetite is there for it yes yeah advice research training education it's absolutely all part of the process isn't absolutely. it yeah, yeah. We're, we're only reverting back to to the assemblages that we should have that we have over centuries and and millennia eliminated and it just makes perfect sense yeah. to me, but but everyone's got to be on board. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Rhoda, your view on it? Yeah, no, I'm in I'm in agreement. I think you know, like I said before, we're we're lacking some of our apex predators here, and you know, we're responsible as humans for eradicating these creatures from our environment, um, and our wildlife has suffered subsequently. You know, things are out of balance essentially, um, and I think, like you said, it's it's just it's super important to make sure that um, with everybody being on board, making sure that everybody's happy, you know, that, that everybody gets their say. It's very important, particularly, you know, when you've got kind of farmers and, and landowners and people who are potentially would be worried about there being big cats in the, in the UK. I think lots of communication needs to happen with those types of people. Um, and then, you know, perhaps do we need to do a reintroduction programme? They seem to be, to my mind, there's lots of sightings and very credible sightings. Perhaps we've already got you know, quite a decent sized breeding population sure. here. Mm. In which um, case it would be reinforcement or supplementary, because that is done yes. for things like pine martins, Absolutely, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So then monitoring that population properly, um, you know, have, having people really working on, on making sure that that's, you know, I mean, it, it depends. You're going to have, always, always going to have people arguing that, you know, these, these are not species that are, um, should be in the UK when you're looking at, at species that were brought in as, as pets and tro you know, trophy pets and things um, which have come from from other countries but then if you look far enough back in our history you know we, we did have these kind of species here and they are filling a role like I said of the apex predator where we're lacking and, you know when we're having to cull our deer populations because there's nothing to take it out you know yeah. <clears throat> surely it makes sense if, if there's not not an impact um, you know on, on our livestock and our you know and if there is, we can do something well, about we it. Can. Could, we can absolutely do something about it. Something. There's always been, there's, you know, what I've seen, you know, things that I've heard about, it, it's very rare that there's any, you know, there was, there was a spate in the 80s, I think, where there was quite a few sheep killed. But nowadays, you so rarely hear about farmers having any, you know, anything taken. And then there is that possibility to have some compensation in place then. You know, if we could actually say, these, these, yeah, these, these creatures are present, and if you do have something happen, 
he is he is a, a source of, of funding mm. to to mitigate that for you you yeah. know and, and advice and support and we totally, mustn't leave people in totally. the lurch yeah. and keeping people yeah it's that i think people feel perhaps if something like this happens they, they don't know who to reach out to they don't know who to talk to you know to have to have that in place i think would be a, a marvelous idea yeah i think if our if our natural assemblages were, were as they should be that there would be minimal need for animals to prey on livestock mm -hmm. I mean, really, if I was a big cat and I've got a nice, nice little roe deer that I could tuck into in the woods quite nicely. Or just a rabbit. Why, yeah. why would I expose myself and run into the middle of a big field to take out yeah. this big fluffy thing that's going to fill my teeth full of wool? <laughs> you know, it's this kind of yeah, uh, yeah. It doesn't happen much in their native country. No, so. no, 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 exactly. Yeah. And you know, when you've got <laughs> places, you know, in India, for, for example, and, and places in Africa where you've got populations of human beings living in very close proximity to leopard populations. Um, even in those places, it's very rare you might get the odd rogue cat who's a problem, mm. but the majority of the time, coexisting quite happily together, you know, in, in a very small area. And that you, like I said, you know, they're such elusive creatures, you're lucky to see one. You've got people in these, you know, areas where they're, they're quite prolific and, and they may never have seen one in their life. So I think they, they tend to keep their distance from humans if they can. Yeah. Yeah. Great. We're running out of time. Any final points you want to make before we close off? Just to thank you very much. It's been actually lovely to spend some time this weekend with you. Absolutely. Um, we've Absolutely. learned a lot. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, great. Well, it's been a good team effort. Just hasn't a great, it? yeah, a great weekend. So, yeah. 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 And thank you very much for having us on your podcast. Much. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you very <laughs> much. much. Thank you <laughs> great. Thank you. And thanks to Matt Everett and uh, Owen, who are behind the cameras. And um, uh, those of you who are watching this on YouTube, this is a, a rare event having an episode on YouTube. Um, it's normally on an audio podcast, it's a fortnightly production so hope you can join us on the audio episodes normally but uh, and those of you uh, listening thank you very much you can watch it on film if you want to so for now oh, and just a quick mention that uh, the next episode will be from scotland we'll be talking to a countryside ranger and the reports on big cats that were given to him and then twice he had encounters uh, during that episode so uh, scotland is the next episode on big cat conversations thanks for listening everybody take care and all the best mm -hmm.